Good afternoon to you all, and welcome to the Trust's annual event, A Digital Affair, sadly this year only digital. I'm Michael Proctor, Provost of King's College and Chair of the Cambridge Trust Board. It gives me great pleasure to open this event, as Claire has said, being held virtually this year, given the restrictions still in place for physical get-togethers in large numbers. There's no doubt that it's been something of a challenging year, during which we all grappled with adapting to a new normal. Most of my life is spent in meetings, and of course in the last year almost all of them have been online. Many students will also have been at online lectures and seminars, and it will be a challenge, as the pandemic recedes, to return wholly to the in-person experience, even if we wanted to. But at least as far as meeting friends and family goes, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and we all keep our fingers crossed for this. I want to give my warmest thanks to the Trust's team, led by Director Helen Pennant, who in spite of adverse circumstances, have continued with the important work of awarding new scholarships for the next academic year, while supporting more than 1,200 current Trust students through the many disruptions they faced as a result of the pandemic. It's clear to me that the Trust's administration setup with its small integrated team is highly effective in its work, and I'm very grateful to Helen for her leadership in this. The Trust supported students have managed not only to get through the year, but have achieved great things. And you'll see evidence of this throughout the event today. I'll hand over now to Helen, who will tell you more about those achievements and about the Trust's work. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Cambridge Trust's annual event. It seems such a short time ago that I was planning last year's event and wondering whether or not we could go ahead because of a strange new disease called COVID-19. Sadly, we didn't go ahead last year, but this year, I'm very pleased to be able to greet you by video, which now, one year on, seems perfectly natural. It's been an incredible year, most challenging, but also there have been, for me, some high points. Some of the challenges are obvious, and I'm very proud of the way that our students have overcome disruption, both academically and personally, and have found such creative and determined ways to continue their study and research. I'm very grateful to all the Trust's partners who stepped up to provide that extra support needed by our students when they faced severe disruption. Thank you very much. We couldn't have supported the students adequately without you. I'm very proud of the Trust staff who transferred all our operations overnight into their own homes, moving from paper files to an entirely electronic system and continuing to deliver payments to students by electronic means. I hope that's actually made it easier and um, quicker for you to receive your funds. And that's one change that I hope that we'll continue um, with uh, in future. For the Trust, it hasn't just been a case of keeping going, although that in itself has been an incredible achievement. We've also made some considerable strides forward, introducing new scholarship programmes one of which I'm most excited about is our Cambridge Opportunity Scholarships for Masters students. These will help British students who find it difficult to fund their Masters study take up their places at Cambridge. I'm also most grateful to our trustees who have provided unwavering support and guidance to me in this past year. Your advice has been absolutely invaluable. Thank you. I'd like to end by echoing our chair, Professor Michael Proctor, in paying tribute to the wonderful achievements made by our students and to offer you the chance to see a film about those. Over the last 12 months, we've learned how dependent we are on each other. 
Um, I can't pretend that the last 12 months has been an easy time. In fact, it's been very challenging. I'm very proud to say that we haven't just kept going. Uh, we have kept going very successfully, but we've also innovated. Hi, I'm Adria, a first year PhD student at St. John's College, um, and I was really excited about joining the rowing team. Unfortunately, for most of the year, we had to do the trainings over Zoom, but I was able to meet some of my teammates. And now that I'm finally here, I've been able to meet them in person and get in the water with them, uh, and it's been great. One of the things I've achieved this year with the help of the Cambridge Trust has been carrying out interviews for my MPhil dissertation. Um, although usually they would have been carried out in person, and this year they had to be carried out remotely, I've still been able to gather a lot of really useful data, and I'm looking forward to consolidating that into my dissertation. Hello, my name is Jessica Segueira, and I'm a second year PhD student in Latin American Studies. Um, I'm here in Santiago de Chile, um, where although I miss my beloved King's College and my community there, uh, I'm still being quite productive in putting together my book chapters. So I'm happy to be a Cambridge Trust Scholar. Hi everyone, I'm Zhang Monghui from Faculty of Economics. I'm at my college now modeling. I have spent nearly eight months uh, at Cambridge. During the program, I have also successfully got my PhD offer from a university in the US. Uh, researching the financial support of a inclusive education and I truly appreciate the support of the trust in the past. Over the last year I've launched the Historian Highlight blog series with the History Faculties blog Doing History in Public. We ask students to talk about how they came to research their specific area of history, their best archival find, as well as the best and worst advice that they've received as historians in training. I look forward for Cambridge culture to resume, particularly hall and rowing. It was a pleasure to become part of Churchill College, although in a mode of life more contemplative than active. Among my achievements, I count a flourishing reading group on the love of God in medieval Christian, Jewish and Islamic philosophy. I passed my first year PhD review and was encouraged to develop my work into a book project. I am Yandire Reinhard Bonke, a Kenyan Cambridge Trust Scholar. The most notable achievements I had in the pandemic was becoming a green officer and helping set up the Olson College Sustainability and Conservation Hub. This is a paradigm shift and game changer in redefining the college's culture into sustainability. Thank you very much. My name is Shirley. I am a PhD student at the engineering department. Due to the theoretical nature of my research, I've been working from home for over a year now, um, which has been quite challenging. And yet, the past year has also taught me valuable things, especially the value of connection. My close connection with my supervisor, who has been really supportive, allowed me to stay resilient when I got stuck on my project. And slightly unexpectedly, my close connection with my students, established via all the hours I spent in online supervisions with them, has brought me joy and a deep sense of fulfillment, which I am just truly grateful for. The key challenge I've faced this year is in completing most of my MBA remotely with an eight hour time difference. Nevertheless, I am grateful for all Cambridge has done to make this possible and prepare me for the reality of the world going forward, where remote collaboration will become more of the norm than the exception. When the pandemic started, I was doing anthropological field work on Sumba Island, Indonesia. For this, you've got to go out and meet people. I was worried to balance field research and my personal health. However, it was enriching. I got to witness people's resilience and humanities in a peripheral location. I witnessed how lives are lived. Lives should go on while the world is still waiting for the cure. How people on Sumba solve this global problem on day-to-day -day level is culture. Witnessing it reminds me why I learned anthropology in the first place. 
Despite the challenges created by COVID, I was able to be part of a venture launch course that aims to build knowledge and capacity to develop scalable startup ventures. Marquee is a business I developed that seeks to provide maximum exposure of the informal sector in South Africa, capacitating our businesses in the rural areas and in the townships of South Africa. The greatest success stories are the students that we fund. Whether they are taking a leading role in their countries on graduation or simply getting on with their research whilst being an inspiration to others, they're all wonderful success stories. I'm also particularly struck by how um, committed our students are to creating an impact and giving back. To students thinking of applying this year, I would simply say, go ahead and come and join us. Welcome to the Cambridge Trust first live session. Can you all hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Good. Hello. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon, even though we cannot be in person. And it's such a shame because the Fitzwilliam Museum is a lovely location for us all to join. I'm Sue Osterfield, and I've been Deputy Director of the Cambridge Trust since 2008, although I've actually been with the Trust since 1987. That was not long after the Cambridge Trust was formed in the early 1980s when the UK government raised the fees it would charge to overseas students. So the Trust put into place a variety of awards which would enable students to benefit from study at the University of Cambridge and funding partners would join with the Cambridge Trust to make it possible to support as many students as it currently does. So presently we have, as our chair Mike Proctor has told you, about 1,200 students in residence at any one time. And we fund students at all levels of study. So that's undergraduate, masters and PhD. In any given year, we probably consider upwards of about 5,000 applications. And of that number, we probably make about five to 700 awards. Uh, so you can see we are extremely busy and this is our busy period now. So between March and July, we are busy preparing shortlists for our funding partners. We're sending them out, we're making application papers available to them and then we're waiting for the outcome and their selection. So it's a very busy time, as you can see. We support students from everywhere around the world now. Firstly, we're established to support students from the Commonwealth. And that was quickly followed by a sister trust, the Cambridge Overseas Trust. And then from 2013, they merged to form one trust, Cambridge Trust. And we widened our remit to open the doors to students from the European Union and now the UK. So we have a large number of programmes specifically for students so that we can cover anywhere worldwide. Now, the purpose of today is to introduce you to my colleagues in the scholarship team that you probably will have been in touch with because they will have been responsible for sending you your scholarship offer letters. They will have been answering any inquiries you had about the emoluments of your award, about the payments that you were expecting to receive, or just in general answering your questions about the conditions of admission and meeting them in order for you to take up your places to study at Cambridge. And we value uh, your input. You are brilliant students. You've all done extremely well. You've been highly scored and you are um, welcome to join us here in Cambridge. And we just hope you have the best time. And now I'd like to introduce to you my colleague, Michelle Lucas, and she will tell you a bit about her role with the Trust. 
Hello everyone. I hope you're all keeping safe and well in these unusual times. It's lovely to see so many of you today at our virtual event. Hopefully it won't be too long until we can be together again in person. So my name is Michelle Lucas and I am the Senior Scholarships Administrator at the Trust. I joined the Trust in November 2019 and as part of the scholarships team, I'm involved with most of the general day-to-day -day tasks such as responding to applicant and scholar queries, producing applicant shortlists for awards, processing and authorising payments, sending offer letters to new awardees, arranging selection committees and much, much more. As part of my duties, I am one of the primary administrators for extension funding, hardship and any other additional funding applications. Extension funding in particular has been essential due to the pandemic and we aim to help as many scholars as possible to complete their studies. We want all of our scholars to reach their goals and we will do everything we can to help with that. I'm also the first point of contact for undergraduate issues and I help out with the upkeep of the trust database and the scholarship section of our website. It's a very busy job, but it's interesting and varied and there's always something new to learn. At the moment, I'm working with Sue on an ongoing university led project which aims to enhance the student experience by way of an improved application system and funding search for new applicants. The university's developers are making significant changes to the current application portal and funding search based on feedback from applicants and current students with the aim of creating a one stop shop for all of the information that applicants need when applying for funding and admission and with improved communications. The Trust is working closely with the developers to add all of our current scholarships to the new funding search and hopefully make the process of applying for funding as easy and stress free as possible. We know that it can be an anxious time and we really do want to make it better. In what has been quite a tumultuous year, I really do hope you are all enjoying your studies and making the best of your Cambridge experience. You should be incredibly proud of yourselves. Please remember, the scholarships team is always on hand to help you in any way we can. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Ileana D'Onofrio. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Hold on. Uh, hi, everyone. I am so happy to see so many little faces today. Uh, sadly, we have not been able to meet many of you in person this year, but I'm very positive that soon things will go back to normal. My name is Ileana Donofrio. I have been working with the Cambridge Trust since 2009. I am a staff member of the scholarship team that I support during the entire wording process, and I look after several scholarships programs. My job is to identify eligible candidates for scholarships, send shortlist to funding partners, announce awards, support students during the whole entire process until their mission has been confirmed and they are ready to come to Cambridge to pick up their place. Recently, since 2018, I have been responsible for the Cambridge Master's Program. Cambridge Master's Studentships are par cost awards they are jointly funded by the trust and colleges. My job is to propose top scored candidates to different colleges, trying to meet each college requirements. This must be done in a reasonable short time to prevent students to accept offers from other university. We do not want, of course, to lose a student to going to, to Oxford. I think these awards are a great opportunity for master students to support their studies. As you may know, funding for master's courses is very limited and students struggle to find financial support. I am glad that the trust is able to assist many of them. It is very gratifying for me being able to help students to pursue their dreams. This is why I enjoy doing this job very much. You are all an inspiration to me for many different reasons. You know, I have a, a six years old daughter and when I look at her, I hope that one day she will become like one of you. I'm sure that you are all doing very well with your studies. And even if you are not doing very well, I know that you are concentrating all your efforts. So you should be proud of yourself. Please, if you have any problems, contact us. We are here to help. Now, please let me introduce you my colleague, Joe Leeds. Hello, can you hear me? 
Hello, I'm Jo. Um, I'm also a member of the scholarship team. Yep. Um, and I've worked for the Trust for over 20 years. Um, in my job, I deal with inquiries, processing undergraduate and postgraduate applications, assisting Sue and the other members of the team. I also um, process and administer the annual reports. These are very important to the Trust as it keeps us up to date with your progress and also funding partners have access to their student reports. The job I most enjoy doing um, at the Trust is sending out the scholarship offer emails to applicants, as some of these emails will bring joy and potentially change someone's life forever. At the moment, I miss being in the office with my colleagues and face-to-face -face contact with students. I hope we'll be able to return to the office soon. I've lived in Cambridge all my life and hope you're enjoying your Cambridge experience, even if this might be remotely. Please remember we're here for you if you have any questions and good luck in your studies. I'd like to now introduce you to my colleague, Carmen Butler. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our event. I'm sorry that we cannot be with you in person today. I have been working for the Trust for 14 years now, and I can honestly say that this is one of the events that I always look forward to, because it is always a pleasure to catch up with you and hear how your study has been going since you arrived in Cambridge. One of the scholarships that I look after is the Cornwall Shares Scholarships. These are for master's applicants from least developed and lower middle income Cornwall's countries. I am the contact for applicants for this scholarship from when they apply to arranging their flights, enabling them to arrive in the UK in time to start their course, through to arranging their flights home at the end of their course. I have recently been working on the applications from the new applicants for this scholarship and the final results will be available in July. I have also been involved in seeking out applicants that are eligible for the Pamanda Monapa Scholarship. This is a scholarship specifically for Indian Masters applicants who have a close connection with certain areas in the south of India and I will be contacting them when the outcome of this scholarship is known. I'm currently working on the Snowden Scholarship. This scholarship is for Masters applicants who have declared a disability, particularly those with a sensory or a physical disability. The scholarship winners will join the Snowden Trust Disabled Leaders Network of High Achieving Leaders to work together to become an inspirational leader and role model who show the ability to create change and the desire to help and improve the lives of others. We really value our students and all of us on the scholarships team work together to achieve matching the students who are a best fit for the scholarships. It is very satisfying to know that our scholarships enable students to start their achieving their ambitions. I hope you enjoy the rest of our event. I will now hand you over to Tash. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is great to have you all join us at the Trust annual event. And we do hope that you are all having Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Um, it's great to have you all here at the Trust annual event, and we do hope that you are all having a good Cambridge experience now that most of you are back in the UK. We are sorry that we can't be with you at this time, but we hope that your studies are going well. In terms of what my role is at the Trust in brief, I'm presently involved in the processing of applications, i.e. for the Rowan Williams for students from conflict zones or who have suffered abuse of their human rights and the Widening Participation UK Masters Scheme and for Pakistan HEC and scholarship offer letters for those applicants who have been successful in securing funding from the Trust or a funding partner. I'm a member of the Trust Review Panel for those scholars who apply for extension funding or for those who need financial assistance for conference funding or study equipment. These meetings run weekly and we aim to get back to those scholars who apply soon after the meeting. We have had more applications come through since the pandemic started, and we've been able to provide a number of scholars with financial support to help them continue with their studies. 
I also answer various emails, emails which come through daily to the Trust's main inbox, i.e. from applicants and scholars with general inquiries to those who would simply like to know whether they have been successful in securing funding. The Trust is a close-knit team of approximately 15 members and it is our job to help make your time at Cambridge as positive and productive as possible. And just to give you an example of how we work during the year, the university's application window opens between September to December slash January's funding deadlines. Between January and March, when students are being made their conditional office of admission, the trust begins to match students to the available awards with shortlists being sent to some funding partners for their selection process. The main awarding period is between March to July. And from July to September, we are finalizing awards and helping students to meet their conditions in order for them to be able to take up their places at the university or to come into residence in the new academic year. We wish you all the very best in these strange times and we look forward to seeing you in Cambridge soon. I will now hand you back to C. Thank you, Tash. And that just leaves me now to say um, a, a big welcome from my colleague, uh, Sharon Pym, who sadly can't be with us today, uh, but she also looks after our students in residence and deals with many applications for extension funding. Uh, she edits our database, she makes sure that your payments are on time. So um, I'm sure you'll welcome all of uh, the efforts that are being made by members of the scholarship team. And I'd like to say that I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I'm going to say thank you now, and we will be taking a break. English education was significantly disrupted by the political unrest in my country. Coming from such an area of instability, studying law felt like the right path for me. It gave me a sense of purpose, and it was empowering, as my personal experiences formed the basis of my academic interests. Trust me when I say that Cambridge is a magical place, because it has a way of awakening the latent potentials in you. It is a place that allows your ideas and aspirations to grow and succeed. I once made this comment during a panel section and I was asked by a member in the audience why I thought so. And my response was very simple. 
it is the community. From the very first month, I recognized that my journey in this place was going to be incredible. For one, meeting people from various countries, backgrounds, and disciplines made me quickly realize how much of an exotic and rich research hub Cambridge is. I was determined to make the best out of my time in this unique environment. Cambridge is inarguably one of the most renowned institutions of higher learning across the globe. Inevitably, Cambridge's reputation is associated with certain preconceptions. For some aspiring students, especially those from minority groups like myself, Cambridge evokes an impression of exclusivity, elitism and privilege. I was also initially concerned about the impact of these stereotypes on my student life. However, during my time at Cambridge, these identities actually enabled me to engage with many welcoming student communities. I do believe that whoever you are, if you do manage to make your way to Cambridge, you will find the right kind of people and activities for you, or discover things that you didn't even think you'd like. For me, that was rowing. Um, I have never rowed a day in my life, and it somehow became a huge part of my Cambridge experience as I became co-captain of my college's women's team. Sometimes I feel like grabbing every single opportunity there are, but they are just endless. You have loads of varieties to choose from. I have seen myself acquire essential skills across boards. For instance, in leadership, I have led the international community as international officer. What I enjoyed the most was my role as education and career officer at my college. I remember the rush of finishing my workday at the department and cycling all the way back to city center to moderate a graduate talk or help run a career evening. Needless to say, I learned a lot about teamwork, leadership, and organization while making many friends. The Islamic Society and the Pakistani Society especially helped me navigate life at Cambridge while celebrating my religious and cultural identities. The recently built Cambridge Central Mosque, with its sustainable, intricate, and alluring architecture, has now become pivotal to my religious experience at Cambridge especially during the meditative moments of Ramadan and the festivities of Eid. What is unique about this studentship is that it is open to all students from zones of conflict, regardless of whether they are recognized refugees or not. It filled in a gap and allowed students from such backgrounds who do not have the added legal recognition and support of being a refugee to apply for scholarships aimed at students from war torn countries. My activities at Cambridge has received a series of local and international awards, starting from the Vice Chancellor Social Impact Award, which was awarded for my commitment to improving the lives of holders, the Trinity Bradfield Prize, which was awarded for the anti counterfeit uh, technology we were developing, the Excellence Award, which was awarded to me by the Royal Society of Chemistry. I also had an amazing time reconnecting with my favorite sport, playing table tennis with the university team, and even dared to try a new one, playing squash at the college courts. What made my time in Cambridge with all magical were these small moments dining in a candlelit formal, watching a friend dance in a ballet performance, or cheering another play in the Chinese orchestra. During my time at Cambridge, I have indulged my creativity through theatre and dance. I have also improved my humble athletic abilities with rowing, badminton, cycling and running. My engagement in student politics was especially enlightening given the profound geopolitical events of the last few years. More recently, my involvement with GAP Summit and Cambridge University Venture Capital and Private Equity Society have inspired and enabled my professional development. The day I stumbled upon the Rowan Williams Cambridge studentship was the second best day of my life. The first being the day I was awarded the studentship. I'm so thankful for the student-led campaign, CRSC, Cambridge Refugee Student Campaign, for sharing the scholarship on their website, which was how I got to find it and meet the incredible students behind the campaign who assisted me in writing my applications. The scholarship became a turning point in my life. And for the first time, someone who had thought 
he wouldn't be able to see the four walls of the university. Now have an excellent opportunity to travel abroad for his studies. This incident changed my life entirely, inspired me to think beyond the present. It gave me confidence, it gave me control of what I have become today. And I'm indeed grateful that I had such opportunity. As I start my fourth and last year of PhD in 2021, I hope that I continue to benefit from this great research hub, albeit online, and succeed in building my stepping stone towards an exciting career in population aging with international collaborators. Reflecting on my evolving Cambridge experience, I am extremely grateful to platforms like the Cambridge Trust for introducing me to talented people and prompting fascinating conversations. Conversations in crowded seminars, bustling cafes, grandiose dining halls and idyllic gardens. Conversations that resulted in paradigm shifts and lifetime friendships. Conversations that were unfortunately curtailed by COVID-19, yet continued on camera. Conversations that will fondly remain with me far beyond my time at Cambridge. Hello everyone, I'm Tendai Kario. I hope everyone can hear me today. Yes, great. I'll just try and adjust my screen so I can see my fellow speakers with me. Um, bear with me. So I'm Tendai Kario, the Partnerships Manager here at the Cambridge Trust. And today I am joined by Bjorn Blinder from the ACA Scholarships um, Programme, as well as Camilla, who is an ACA Scholar herself. So hello Bjorn and hello Camilla. Hi. Fantastic. It's great to see you here. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so I'm Tendai and I'm the Partnerships Manager. So what that means is I work with our partners from around the world to help create scholarships programs that support students coming to Cambridge. 
I joined the trust about two years ago, so I can't claim to be new anymore, but I still learn a lot from my colleagues. As you heard from Sue, she knows everything at the trust and the team and her team are the engine that drives the trust. So I do learn a lot every day from my team and as well as from our scholars. It's a pity that we can't meet in person today because I would have loved to be speaking with you all in the halls of the Fitzwilliam Museum. Usually we have our partners in attendance and that's why we thought it would be great to have Bjorn here to speak with us today, as well as Camilla, so that you can hear from one of the scholars who is in and amongst us in Cambridge as well. So I'll just give you a little bit of background about the trust and why it works with um, funding partners. The trust would not be able to offer as many programs as it does if it wasn't for our funding partners who help us to create scholarship programs that not only help you to come to Cambridge, but also to thrive at Cambridge. I've been delighted to meet many of our funding partners over the past year virtually, which is quite good for me. So I would say the virtual working has worked well for me as I would not have been able to travel as further afield as Mexico or Pakistan or indeed Norway. So that has worked well for me and I've managed to engage with quite a few of our funding partners. I'd like to say a big thank you to our partners as well for stepping in and helping us help to support our students, especially over the last year where they have had to extend some of their studies, postpone and not have access to labs. I know Camilla will attest to that, the struggles of getting to a lab. So I really want to say thank you for your unwavering support to our partners, including the ACA scholarships. I thought it'd be great to have a conversation today with Bjorn and Camilla, just to find out more about the program and um, with Camilla about how it she has experienced Cambridge as an ACA scholar. So I'll start by speaking with Bjorn and just find out a bit more about the ACA scholarship pro program. Thank you, Bjorn, for joining us. Hi. Hello there. So Bjorn, I thought it would be great if we could just give us a bit of a background on the ACA scholarships program and the foundation that helps fund these programs. Okay. Um, the ACA scholarship is six years old now. Um, it's just, it was established by one of Norway's wealthiest families. Um, the objective of the program is to enable our top talent in Norway to go and learn from the best in the world, independent of family wallets. And then we hope that they come back and can do great things. Uh, uh, that's simple. Um, there are no strings attached. Uh, we take people from all fields of study. We support master uh, and or PhD degrees. Um, uh, so that's from all fields. Um, and then we, um, um, we work with nine universities. Uh, so Cambridge is one of them. Uh, we currently have 16 scholars. For well, this academic year, we have 16 scholars in Cambridge. Totally, we have 65 out um, on support. Of course, they're all over the world now, but... Uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other schools we work with are places like Harvard, MIT, Stanford. Great, right. but Cambridge is the best, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think so. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's basically the program. Uh, I think what distinguishes us from uh, other scholarship programs is that we are quite hands-on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we are um, selecting people before they apply to the university. Right. Uh, which is sounds weird, maybe, because we <laughs> we will we can give like people like Camilla a scholarship to go to Cambridge before she has applied. Um, uh, <laughs> but but we do select top talent. Um, mm -hmm. We have a rigorous process, and then the 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 people we so we basically select individuals, and these individuals that we decide to invest in, they can apply to relevant programs at the nine schools we work with. Right. And then when they decide to go and they are admitted, um, we will fund them. So oh, that's fantastic. basically the mechanism. Fantastic. And in, in terms of the process of applying for an ACA scholar for potential scholars, do, do they come to you in a particular um, pattern, a fashion, or is there a way that they can apply to you? Can you explain briefly just what the process looks like for a potential applicant? Yeah, yeah they, they apply to us end of September. Uh, right. And then we run a quite rigorous uh, selection process with the help of seven leading academics, Norwegian right. academics. So our really top researchers uh, set aside two to three days to make interviews with us. 
Um, so we usually interview about 70, 75 students. Wow, okay. Take about 25. Right. Um, and then we, uh, each student goes through four interviews. So it's a, it's a dance, you walk out a bit dizzy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then we check references. Uh, of course. And on the basis of that, we have a discussion with our board and, and also with our founders. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we select the people. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where how we work differently with students hits in right. because we actually work with the students through the application process. Oh, that's fantastic. We coach them, we advise them on where to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we will check their application to see that, you know, that they're doing the right thing. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and we have discussions with them. Sometimes mm -hmm. we fly them over, uh, mm -hmm. like we did with Camilla. We flew her over to Cambridge when she was admitted before oh, wow. she decided to go there. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. That sounds very hands-on and that must keep you very busy at the foundation. How big um, is your team there to do all of these things? We're two and a half. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's they, a lot of work. Uh, uh, the work with the students, I do myself mostly. Wow. Okay. Um, but, that's uh, the other full time employee is working more on the uh, Norwegian side of it. Um, right. It's on the uh, administration of the application system, uh, mm -hmm. you know, social media, every, all kinds of things, all the other stuff, basically. <laughs> Fantastic. That's a lot. And I do appreciate you taking time out of a busy period at the moment. I think like us, you're quite busy as well, just um, working with applicants and already scholars in residence. So I do appreciate you um, coming to join us today as well. Uh, I just thought I'd also check with you how, how much has the program grown since its inception? You know, the whole ACA scholarships, not just as Cambridge, but in general. No, in terms of schools, we 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 started working. We, we kind of thought ten. Uh, mm -hmm. We we started with nine, mm -hmm. and we've kept it that way. Uh, right. We have a dialogue with ETH in Surrey, so we might include them. But apart from that, we're basically s sticking with the original plan. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of thought to start with twenty, uh, right. then go to forty. I think we. Uh, we quickly went to 30 and then mm -hmm. we're trying to make it back down to 25 uh, and then <laughs> close uh, in, in so we're 20 to 30 um, average has been 25 uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, the size is basically driven out of our ability to uh, to support the students at a reasonable quality of it's course. Not, there's some balls on the floor but uh, <laughs> yeah, okay Definitely. And I understand that the support is not just financial. I, I, I have been looking at your website and just speaking to others as well. You provide some sort of community as well and mentoring yeah, amongst the students. Yeah. So we, we have a community of scholars. The, mm -hmm. We're trying to build a culture of good people helping others and each other, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of community service type thing. Mm -hmm. um, we are um, also connecting students. Uh, mm -hmm. We're helping them on career advice. Uh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yesterday I spoke with a PhD student, and then uh, next week I'll be pushing his PhD advisor on uh, making sure that she will support his uh, postdoc application. <laughs> and lots of time. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Those kind of things. So it's the whole journey, which is fantastic to hear because I think, you know, for some of us, you know, I, I have insight into, you know, our partnerships, but I think for some people out there, our students, especially, they don't realize some support that is offered, you know, through programs and the work that goes into it. Because as an applicant, you do apply for something that looks, you know, attractive, that will help you, but you don't quite realize how much goes into it. So it's really great to hear from you about the program. And I am delighted that, you know, the initial phase at Cambridge was really successful and we're going to the next phase, which I'm very optimistic about because the ACA scholars are such a valuable addition to the University of Cambridge. And we look forward to meeting a lot more of them coming to Cambridge soon. And with that, I will just start speaking with um, Camilla, who will give us an insight yes. as an ACA scholar herself. <laughs> Important part. <That's> exactly. <laughs> Hi, Camilla. Hi, how are you, Tender? I'm okay, thank you. It's good to see you. I'm just trying to find you now on my screen because I can't see you. I have found you. 
Fantastic. So Camilla, it's great to see you today. And um, thank you for taking time out of what is a busy schedule to join us here at the event. I know you've been darting back and forth from the lab mm -hmm. and you did try to tell me what you are researching. And I have to admit, I'm still none the wiser because it all sounds very intelligent, which is beyond my reach actually. So I just thought it'd be nice to have a chat with you and just find out a bit more about who's Camilla and why did Camilla decide to come to Cambridge? So if you wouldn't mind just letting us know a bit about yourself. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm 26 years old. I'm on my third year for my PhD now, uh, finishing a third year that's been a bit bumpy because obviously mm -hmm. uh, second year was a bit bumpy because of um, the pandemic starting and kind of uh, labs closing and we've all had a, a tough year. So just getting back, back on track now. Um, I'm at the mitochondrial biology unit here mm -hmm. at the University of Cambridge, and I grew up in Argentina and Norway. So I Fantastic. yeah did my had my first years of life in Argentina, um, and then as a teenager moved to Norway with my family, and then I did my high school bachelor's and master's at the University of Bergen mm -hmm. in the west coast of Norway. Wow. And I I've always had the dream of coming to Cambridge. I think I think it's because well the amazing scientists in the field of biology and molecular biology that have been here. Um, so it's just like, yeah, names like Darwin and Sanger, and there's particularly this Argentinian scientist who was here um, wow. in his PhD that he won a Nobel Prize, he's one of the Argentina Nobel Prize winners, and Fantastic. he was here. So it's always, um, his name is Cesar Milstein, by the way. Um, and yeah, it kind of was really inspiring. and. And it put Cambridge on, on the map for me. So that's fantastic. Always to wanted to come that. here. And then, um, yeah, I was able to through the Acro Scholarship as well. So that's, that was good. Um, I guess the reason why I'm here is as well that I found the research I really wanted to do. So, right. um, yeah, we have a really good hub in mitochondrial biology here at Cambridge. So. Oh, that's great. I can imagine, you know, he's sitting in the pandemic just thinking the lab is closed. That must have driven you crazy because you want to get on with things, really, don't you? A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. It was a bit of a, a change in, in lifestyle. I, I wasn't able to go back home, so I, I stayed here in college. Right. I'm not living in college right now, but I was in college. Right. And it was it was something to be there and you feel like you're here to do your research and your PhD and then being here not being able to do that was was a little bit tough, but we got, we got past it. And, and the town was quite quiet as well, because usually you have a lot of activity. So I suppose you only had the swans and the cows of Cambridge to keep you company. <laughs> really. Yeah, a few Absolutely. walks with people when I was you know, with, with one person when that was allowed, but yeah, it was very quiet and it was quite weird to see the streets of Cambridge so empty. It is. It used to the students and tourists and it was just, just a very few people just walking around. Right. So what have you, despite all the things happening in the pandemic, did you find something that you particularly enjoyed? Might have been before the pandemic, but yeah. you might have had something that you really enjoyed. Cambridge is an amazing place to be at. The mm -hmm. pre-pandemic it's getting there now but yeah just the college life is great I think um I wasn't that that's something very different from a home and like university at home so like you meet people from such different backgrounds and yeah. and fields of research and you live with them and you you have dine with them at college and and that's really really nice so that's something that I think it's particularly wonderful from Cambridge so I hope we can get back to that a little bit and um yeah just in research we have so many resources and uh -huh. wonderful people to learn from so i am definitely spoiled with that <laughs> that's good and i was really particularly interested in finding out how you found about found out the about the ACA scholarship and how you found that process and what it means to be an ACA scholar because you know i just think ACA scholarship ACA scholars but what does that mean to you well, I found out through my university, so they were, they were looking for people, um, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, it means a lot. It means it means a lot because it it keeps my connection with Norway as well. So yes. I'm not 
Norwegian, but I lived there for half my life and okay. I do love the country. I have a lot of wonderful things about Norway, about how, you know, the welfare system and it's, it's a wonderful country to live in and to feel a part of. So that's, that's really nice. Um, but also the Acre Scholarship, we're looking for people who don't only stand out academically, but are also interested in making a difference. Right. So that really, really was interesting to me because I knew that that would be a platform to meet a lot of interesting people that were also really nice and interested in helping others. So that's, that was an interesting factor and they offer full funding as well. Uh -huh. So um, that, that's very important. That's and great. something that Bjorn, Bjorn mentioned as well is that <laughs> they do give you the, or tell you that they'll give you the funding before you apply to the university. So you have a lot of peace of mind. And I think that's that's really good in the process because it, it allows you to focus in the process later on. So we I applied for the Acre Scholarship in beginning of October. Mm -hmm. And when I was applying for, for what I wanted to do here at Cambridge and talking to potential supervisors, I I didn't have to worry about, about funding. I, I was just worried about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and who I wanted to do it with. So yeah. Oh, so that's really great that Bjorn and his team are giving you peace of mind, plus also assistance in applying and, you know, direction. Sometimes it's, it's I think it's very useful to have that support. It just puts your mind at ease. And there are not very many scholarships programs that work in that way, actually. Usually you apply for the place and apply for the scholarship. So that's actually unusual. But, you know, it's really interesting to hear that the impact it has on your mindset as you apply. Yeah, and I think what's great about them is that they cater for what the person needs. So mm -hmm. if you if you really do need help, they'll give it to you. And if you if you know what you want to do and you kind of sorted that out by yourself, they they also mm -hmm. they're also happy for that. Oh, so, so they they do help a lot if you need it, I guess. That's great. I'm pretty sure Bjorn hasn't sent you an email to say, oh, say all the nice things about the scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> You're just reinforcing what he said. But, you know, thank you for letting me know about that a process, the um, process of applying for an ACA scholarship, and obviously being an ACA scholar. I'm really interested in your research, your area of research, and what motivated you to choose this particular field. And I will try and pay attention um, so that I can understand <laughs> what it is that you're studying. Yeah. So I, I can tell you my motivation first and afterwards I prepare a set of slides that, that will come up probably because I thought it's, it's a field of research that maybe just, just to give you a hint, but it's a little bit better with, with some pictures. Right. So I'm, I'm actually really fascinated by how like humans can move, feel, think and how like if you break it down to the molecular level, we're pretty much made of like DNA, proteins and lipids interacting and we have very robust mechanisms, but mm -hmm. to me, it's essential to study these basic mechanisms of life in order to be able to understand what happens when they go wrong and we have right. disease. So uh, eventually it like, you need to understand how things work in order to be able to prevent on or cure disease. So that's, okay. that's kind of my motivation. And oh, I'll try to explain good. a little bit of what I do in the slides, <laughs> so. Fantastic. I think, um, I think Claire or Matt are going to help us with the slides in a minute. Right, can you see the slides there, Camilla? Yes, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna talk about mitochondria and the energy of life. I work at the mitochondrial biology unit, so it's, <laughs> it's a bit redundant, but yeah, if you can move on to the next slide. So, um, energy is required for everything that happens in our bodies. So from food processing, what we call metabolism, to movement through muscle con uh, contractions and the electric impulses in the nerve cells that allow us to think, feel and communicate. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, our bodies are made up of trillions of cells and different cells have different functions. And they can organize into tissues and organs which make up our body. If you move, yeah. Next slide. So the cell is the fundamental unit of life, and each cell is made of different parts called organelles, and each organelle has a different function. So here we can see, for example, the nucleus on top in purple, mm -hmm. and 
the nucleus contains the genetic information, um, what we call the DNA, mm -hmm. and that's part of its function to hold it and to protect it. We also have another organelle called the mitochondria, which is the focus of my work. The mitochondria there, you can see them in, in orange. And if we move on to the next slide. Um, I, I work with uh, mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. And they're very interesting organelles with very unique features. So they have their own DNA called mitochondrial DNA. This is something that a lot of people don't know about. So you know, all of the DNA is in the nucleus, like a part of it is in the mitochondrial and it has a different function. It's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they also are bound by a double membrane system. So we can see here that we have an inner membrane mm -hmm. in the membrane and an outer membrane. I wish I could point at it, but yeah. <laughs> so, they're called the powerhouse of the cell because they transform the chem chemical energy from the food into mm -hmm. an energy form that the cell can use, so the ATP. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, there are many proteins. Proteins are little machines, kind of, mm -hmm. that sit on the inner membrane here, depicted in, um, these proteins are depicted in, in green and purple. Mm -hmm. And these proteins allow for molecules, including the breakdown products of foods, Mm -hmm. uh, such as sugars, amino acids, and lipids, to get into and out of the mitochondria. So they kind of control the passage of the molecules mm -hmm. into and out of the mitochondria. And these okay. proteins are called mitochondrial transporters. Right. Now, in the lab where I work, and I'm doing my PhD, we study mitochondrial transporters. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we do a lot of things, but <laughs> you know that um, in simple terms, some of them mm -hmm. do not have a function assigned to them. Right. This means that we know these proteins are there in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and we know that they have an important or even essential function, but mm -hmm. we don't know what that function is. Right. So we, we work, a part of our work is to try to assign them the function that they have in order to mm -hmm. be able to then study them properly and mm -hmm. know that if they're involved in some, some disease. Right. And for the, for the proteins that we do know what they do, we mm -hmm. work in, in, finding out more about their function, how they work, mm -hmm. what's the mechanism of action and their structure. Mm -hmm. So here mm -hmm. in the right mm -hmm. side of the slide, we have two, an example of like the structure of two or models of structure of two mitochondrial carriers. Um, one of them they call the ADP ATP carrier, which transports ADP, which is a molecule into mitochondria and ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell out of it. So it just it modulates all of the energy metabolism of, of the cell and the other one transports phosphate. So it's just, just examples of what, what kind of we do in the lab. And Fantastic. if we move on to the next slide, um, you're gonna see a picture of me in the lab where I do my research on my first. <laughs> and I do hope that this presentation has given you some information on the importance of mitochondria in providing the energy of life. So. That's fantastic. I would have not known about any of that. And I have to admit, I might have to find you and sort of sit over a coffee and ask yes, you to explain some of the things. Anything. And I'm just fascinated that, you know, you chose this field. So really thank you for sharing that with us. And, you know, I'm just conscious of the time because I could talk to you for a long time and I could bring Bjorn back in and we could carry on. But unfortunately, we do have other speakers who have to come on to the session. But before we go, I just thought I'd ask you a very quick question. What have you found quite surprising at Cambridge or within the city itself? Is there one thing that you find I found quite surprising? Um, so... I've, everything, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that have surprised me, but I guess um, the one thing that I can say, think of right now is that uh, just every, how nice everyone is, or I've, <laughs> I've had a really good experience, I guess, but maybe, maybe just if you just smile to people before I see you, but um, where I started, I guess, Cambridge mm -hmm. and the whole experience of Cambridge and hearing about it, you think it's quite daunting and intimidating and you think people, you know, are going to be really tough on you and mm -hmm. just maybe uh, you're a little bit scared but <laughs> people people are really accommodating and nice and the, at least in my unit as well people want to teach you and 
and I've been really lucky to be in such a good environment and then the people that you meet at college everybody's kind of in a similar situation because we're all far from home and uh -huh. you kind of find a, a second family so that's fantastic. been it's very fantastic oh, thank you Camilla and Bjorn before I go I just want to ask you one quick question um basically how optimistic are you about you know the future post-pandemic you know just looking at the landscape with those scholars coming to Cambridge are you quite optimistic as um, as a foundation? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, we are. Uh, um, this time last year, uh, mm -hmm. I basically advised everyone to prepare for not going to university. So we mm -hmm. pulled the handbrake on every, you know, at least for the people going to the US, we basically uh -huh. stopped it uh, mm -hmm. for the masters. Uh, and then for the people going to the UK, we, we advised them to think, you know, strongly about postponing. <laughs> Of course, well, people went anyway, uh, mm -hmm. and they suffered in the year. Uh, it's been awful, I think, for many. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but our perspective is now that mm -hmm. you know, we hope that we've s that we see return to normality after the summer. Uh, of course, there can be variants coming. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. know, but uh, we we plan for business as usual from the autumn. That's fantastic to hear. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you to Bjorn and Camilla for taking the time out of your busy diaries to join us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you very much, both of you. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Rowan Williams and some of the Rowan Williams scholars. This is another scholarship program that the Trust provides to support students coming to Cambridge. I hope you've enjoyed my chat with Camilla and Bjorn, and thank you for joining us, to, joining the session. I remember last year, it was wonderful to have the opportunity of meeting those people who were benefiting from this named scholarship, both at the start of their time in Cambridge and at the end of the academic year as well. This year, because of all sorts of things, including my own move from Cambridge, it's not been quite so easy to organize. I think even in like the short time um, that I've been here with all the challenges of COVID and lockdowns, um, I found like a great community uh, within my classmates. Uh, somehow it just uh, happened that all of us were international students. Definitely it was challenging, but it was also an amazing journey. The PhD journey uh, is challenging and intellectual by itself. Um, it just made me, to be honest, uh, deconstruct a lot of the, the way I was looking at the world. It made me rethink and we see the world in a different way. The year has been a bit different because uh, things have been um, online, but uh, I've, been, I've been happy with uh, how the, the, the faculty has uh, delivered the course. Um, I've been happy with how the colleges, uh, my college, St. Edmunds College, have uh, supported me as well. Um, and yeah, we've had a really good uh, uh, scholars community as well. Um, so we've, we've met virtually. I haven't, been, I haven't had the chance to meet them in person, but we've met virtually, virtually uh, I think in November and then we've had a group chat as well. It's incredibly difficult to, you know, describe into, in such a short amount of time the amount of skills, expertise, uh, experiences, um, and the number of connections and friends I've made over the course of uh, this scholarship. Just to have a university like Cambridge, uh, you know, uh, offer me this position um, has been um, transformative in the sense of my self-confidence as well, because I think as a minority person in India, when you say a lot of things, your res the response is to see you with suspicion. So every claim you make is, um, you know, so in, in, in just that aspect, I've seen my um, confidence grow uh, in terms of what I want to do with my research and of course the expertise had helped. I came to the UK with my uh, student visa and I started um, actually uh, higher education here in the UK. Now uh, I'm doing a PhD uh, in Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet with friends actually yet in person so uh, I hope to meet all of you very soon. In person. I've been actively engaged with a lot of extracurricular activities, which I think is really important. If you are doing something really cerebral, I, I need something more physical to balance it out. So it's amazing to have uh, rowing communities and all the other uh, gardening and, you know. So, uh, like I said, despite my anxieties, uh, I've actually quite enjoyed my time here so far. 
higher education has the potential to transform, but it's got to transform itself first in, in so many ways. We could say we've been trying quite hard to widen our access, but there's so much we, we haven't seen and haven't spotted yet, so much to learn. An interesting thing um, I learned when I came to Cambridge, I always thought that the higher education sector is a sector that very we look at it as a way to enhance uh, quality of life for people and e e equality. But then like when I was reading in literature, I found that unfortunately the higher education sector could reproduce the inequality that already existed uh, inequality in society. Because if we look at it, the majority of people who access the higher education sector are those who can afford it, are those who are in a good position to enter the sector. So it, the sector could play a, a role in reproducing the same inequalities and be a way to divide the society, the elites and the uneducated. So it has its own problem as, as a whole, as a sector as well. And this is why I appreciate this scholarship that gives opportunity to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to um, like to such opportunities. I had my anxieties before moving here because I think Oxbridge can be seen at least from the outside as a very elite space. Uh, but once I got here, I took to it like fish to water. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, it, it has been challenging, of course. I feel often pushed to my intellectual limits where I'm like staring at a wall. But I think that's a good experience. I think education is the main way for us to sort of go forward. I think international aid uh, by itself won't be able to do anything. I think education um, is the only way for us to become sustainable, for us to become sustainable. This scholarship rested on a very strong conviction that the calling, the task of the Cambridge Trust was to go on making more and more openings available to people who otherwise would not have that opportunity. And I was just overjoyed at the Trust's decision to push the boat out in this direction, create some new opportunities. And I'm really so pleased to have this chance of listening to how it's been for you. Really, all I want to do is, is say every blessing for me and every, every warmest wish to you as, as you move on. And again, the most heartfelt thanks for giving the time for this conversation. I've really, really been grateful for it. Thank you very much um, to all who were um, instrumental in making that uh, film, which um, I do find quite moving. And it is now my pleasure, Helen Pennant, the director of the Cambridge Trust, to um, talk to some of the alumni of our um, scholarships. Um, so I'm joined by Parry D, who I can see on the screen, and Andrew Clark and Yomna Zentani, who have all graduated. And um, Paridi, I'd like to start with, with uh, asking you first. Um, I think you are the, uh, were the first of, of the, the three to graduate. And um, can you uh, tell us um, something of your pathway to Cambridge and what you have done since? Thank you. Thank you, Helen, and hi, everyone. I'm Paridi. I did engineering at St. John's College um, and specialized in electronics engineering. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, what drew me into engineering in the first place? Um, as a student at school, science and maths was always fascinating to see how things that we do in the lab can transform the world. And engineering was, for me, the pathway to see the application of these great theories and um, you know, the principles that could transform people's lives. And so I wanted to do engineering, but of course, as a school student, you are still not quite sure which side of engineering you want to go into because there's, there's many possibilities. So there were many possibilities, be it say civil engineering, where you, uh, you can see how people transform people's day-to-day -day lives through the basic amenities, facilities, or be it electronics, for example, where we are connecting people, enhancing their user experience. And so Cambridge, for me, provided that platform to do that course, to, the, to do the general engineering course, where we study all the different branches and then specialize in electronics. So what have I been up to since? Um, so I specialize in electronics and then towards the end of my um, degree, I was uh, awarded the St. John's College Innovation Internship, 
award where I was based at a company for two months mm -hmm. and that for me personally was my go no go am I heading in the right direction because a lot of my friends went into completely different sectors and I was like am I doing the right thing mm -hmm. am I going in the right direction and I enjoyed that internship it was great so I was at Cambridge Display Technology just outside of Cambridge and I was like yes this is where I'm heading and I'm enjoying this and then from there on now I'm working with touch sensing technology specifically on force touch um, mm -hmm. so to give you a bit of context how in our phones at the moment if we tap or if we swipe it's all the same but we are mm -hmm. working on force sensing. So say, for example, if you're outside in the rain and you push on it, the phone detects that you're pushing and it's not an accidental gesture. And it's not that your phone just becomes uh, completely um, non-functional just because something else is going on. So we are working on force touch. I'm based at Cambridge Touch Technologies, which is a, a, sp a startup out of, out of University of Cambridge. And it's been a great journey since. Um, so that's what I've been up to. Thank you very much, and I think I think uh, you've you've illustrated um, very nicely how um, ch challenging it can be to find one's pathway uh, to 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 what is really inspiring. And um, I do think that is something we we all hope um, you will find while you're at Cambridge. And uh, you seem to have translated it very concretely by doing an internship that you were connected with while you were at Cambridge. Um, have you got any advice for current students um, uh, who, who might, uh, might be wanting to start thinking about their next steps? Mm -hmm. How can they make the most of being at Cambridge to take them to the next place? Sure. So one of the things I think I'd like to reflect back on, that internship was one of the elements, and that was more towards the end of the course. But of course, throughout the Cambridge experience, as Camilla highlighted, and I'm sure other members will as well, we have a lot of opportunities, be it at college, be it at the department, and the interactions we have with our fellows and our students that really shape our understanding of the world. So internship, yes, being a subset, but there were also other activities. So we had a hackathon at CERN by the Cambridge University Engineering Society. So there were 26 of us uh, who all hopped onto the plane, onto the plane off to um, Geneva at mm -hmm. CERN. We were based there for three days and it was a mixture of first years, second years, third years, fourth years, some of us who'd never even met before. And mm -hmm. it was a fascinating experience as being put out as though we are solving a real world problem. There you go, as engineers, what would you do? Yes. And it's experience such as those that really let us think out of the box because the mm -hmm. academic side at Cambridge is well known. We are renowned for what we do, mm -hmm. be it from Isaac Newton to Darwin. Mm -hmm. We've got plenty of names mm -hmm. here that are acknowledged everywhere, but it's also the soft, soft skills, as it were, yes. or is it the mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. personalized experiences? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the journey at Cambridge that really make it special. So for me, mm -hmm. um, there were, of course, the engineering activities, right, be it from the lectures, labs, the usual. But then outside of that, there were activities such as the Cambridge Union, so the debating society, we're doing something mm -hmm. there, we're mm -hmm. meeting speakers from other fields, interacting with them, or be it a cultural program. So we have a charity show called Mastana that happens every year where students are running a show dancing singing acting mm -hmm. everything and these skills really shape us for the world of mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. so i feel that for me as if i may say so as an advice for students who are currently in their process of education would be make the most of your student experience uh, university life shapes us for future all along our experiences remain ingrained in our memory and i think do not worry about you know where the career is heading, where the jobs are heading. It's natural, it comes, and more so in times like these where we are surrounded by the pandemic. What's going mm -hmm. to happen? What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. But I think we are, at, we are at such a luxury and we are you know, blessed to have a great community of people around us and we should make the most of the connections that we have. So I'd say mm -hmm. for every student, make the most of the student experience while you are at Cambridge albeit remotely, we are all mm -hmm. a click away, you know, on mm -hmm. the phones, on Zoom, mm -hmm. 
but make the most of the student experience academically and outside of it because that really shapes us as people beyond mm -hmm. and for me the Cambridge experience has really changed the way how, how I approach life so not just what I do but how I do it based on the experiences that I've had so far and if I may just if I may just add Helen I think the Cambridge Trust played a crucial role for me um, I don't think we've had this uh, conversation before but at the time when I applied I was in a unique situation because I, so when I came to the UK, I accompanied my parents um, and the plan was I would go back to India with them. I was just accompanying them and go back with them. Of course, it was at a, a time of my education where I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so we applied and academically everything went well. Cambridge uh, offer was there. But then I was in a difficult situation because I was not quite covered by law. I couldn't apply for any Indian scholarship because I was a resident in the UK. So I didn't go mm -hmm. to an Indian school, mm -hmm. whereas I couldn't apply to the UK scholarships because I'm an Indian citizen who didn't meet that. And that's when the trust came in as opening that doorway, opening with welcome arms, come to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. so that overall, the Cambridge experience has been possible because of that. Oh, thank you so much for, for, for saying that, Paridi. I mean, we, we do aim to be flexible. Um, and I, I think uh, when I heard our scholarships team start at the beginning of the programme, I, I realised that, you know, we do aspire to offer a very personal connection with the students. And, um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, and also you know, what you've said about the value of being at Cambridge, um, it's it, the academics are extremely valuable, I and mean, Camilla has illustrated, you know, the the, the, the sort of world-leading research that comes out of you know, engaging with all the facilities. But those those other connections that we make um, in in other activities or, or just daily life, the, the 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 routine of eating with people who are studying with different in different um, disciplines, those can be the things that really make life changing. Um, uh, connections for us for, for the next stage. Um, so yeah, well, thank you very much. And um, now if I may ask Andrew to, to, to say something about um, how you came to Cambridge and uh, what you're, you're doing now. And uh, I mean, even actually where you're speaking from, because I, I, I noticed something slight <laughs> intriguing you said about your connection. So, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Helen. It's uh, it, it's great to be uh, to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Um, I am uh, coming to you uh, live from a a, uh, a hiking. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit nicer than a hut, but uh, I am in uh, in England's Lakes District at the moment. Uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sure if if the connection would be stable enough to be with you, but. Uh, I can see you you nodding and smiling, so I, I think I must be coming through. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's it's um, no, it's great to be with you today. Uh, I had uh, quite a traditional path uh, to Cambridge, I think. Uh, in Australia, where I'm from, I uh, enrolled in a, an undergraduate degree uh, studying law. Uh, and after, after graduating from uh, Macquarie University, a, a, a very, very young university uh, in Australia, unlike, uh, unlike Cambridge, uh, I spent some time uh, working in my field as a lawyer uh, and then uh, went to Cambridge to study a master's in corporate law uh, where I matriculated uh, at Jesus College. Um, the, the master's uh, at Cambridge uh, for me was was a bit of a watershed moment in uh, two senses. Uh, firstly, because it significantly uh, redirected uh, my focus in my professional field. I, I changed uh, my um, my specialty after spending my time in Cambridge to to now do uh, uh, in, to now do uh, legal disputes relating to infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, large toll roads, power plants, nuclear facilities, uh, oil and gas mining. Uh, and I think the, the reason that uh, Cambridge uh, drew me in that direction uh, is, is because uh, is, is exactly because of 
uh, what uh, what Prahi has just has just mentioned to us. Uh, Cambridge is an environment where you'll sit in a dining hall or or sit in or, or share an accommodation block with people who are in wildly different fields. Uh, and, and for me uh, at Jesus College, which is uh, well known uh, as, an, as predominantly an engineering college uh, rather than as, as, a college, uh, as a college for law students, um, this meant I meant uh, a lot of civil engineers, uh, a lot of electrical engineers and sitting around the dinner table, you know, discussing the issues that uh, affected their field, uh, the risks of rolling out new technologies, how those risks affected ordinary people, be it people driving over a bridge, be it people who are drawing their electricity for their uh, businesses and their homes from a new nuclear power plant, and, and the safety risks associated uh, with businesses and residences being built uh, near or, or even above, in the case of a tunnel, uh, some of these facilities. Uh, was, was extremely interesting to me. Uh, and getting to understand the interplay between the practice of law and uh, other academic uh, disciplines like engineering uh, really opened my eyes to what would be a much more practical uh, way to, to practice law rather than my previous field, which was which was a little bit more, uh, I, I guess you'd call it esoteric in the law and mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. further mm -hmm. removed from uh, how the law affects people on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the second major way that doing the master's degree at Cambridge uh, radically altered, altered my professional direction uh, was that it really opened the door for me to uh, work in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and that's that's exactly why I'm in the in the Lake District now, uh, in in uh, very far from Australia, in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, that's because uh, although I returned to Australia uh, for a few years after I uh, I did my master's degree, I uh, in in early 2019 uh, returned to the UK uh, to uh, a very a very large and well known international law firm. Uh, called Linklaters. And this, this was a door that was uh, open for me because uh, I had that uh, UK and international, uh, you know, stamp of quality uh, that is uh, having graduated from, uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, is it possible to work internationally without a degree from Cambridge? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, but is that path just... Uh, so much wider open, uh, so much easier to, to tread uh, if you've been to an institution like Cambridge. Uh, absolutely. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that um, my university in Australia, Macquarie University, is a, is a very young university. It's about 60 years old. Uh, and, you know, it, its international reputation is building, uh, but, it's, but it's not operating at the level of uh, the University of Cambridge for, for obvious reasons. Uh, so, so certainly uh, the University of Cambridge opened that door for me uh, to work internationally in England uh, and really, really smoothed the transition for me uh, mm. moving to the other side of the world. Mm. Because the University of Cambridge has such a international community, uh, both amongst the scholars and the student body, uh, when I moved to the other side of the world, it, 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 it was no longer you know, uh, perhaps the scary move it, it might have been originally mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. arriving in London, uh, I had uh, friends I'd met, you know, undergrads, postgrads, uh, both English and, and from overseas that, like me, had, had mm -hmm. taken their career to London uh, after, after studying at Cambridge. And uh, that, that's just a marvellous opportunity um, that, you know, isn't, you know, isn't, isn't, necessarily open or, or, or readily available uh, to uh, people who have done all their academic study domestically as it is uh, to those amongst us who have uh, studied internationally at a place like Cambridge. Uh, so uh, well, I think that's a really important point and that, that uh, most of the students supported by the Cambridge Trust are, are, are international. Um, and those, those of, uh, of, of you who come from the UK, you study in an international environment, you have to naturally acquire the skills 
to to uh, to operate uh, in in that way across cultural linguistic boundaries and understanding another point of view. I think I mean I must say I think that's a really essential thing at Cambridge. And when you come as an international student, you've taken that that leap of faith that. that going outside your comfort zone. And, and that just is, a, is um, um, I'm sure it's very challenging, but it's also, uh, it, 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 it makes, um, it makes for, for, for a unique perspective and learning uh, opportunity here. So um, I think you've done really wonderfully. And are you going to keep in touch uh, with us uh, once you're, you're established in your job in London? Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's you know it's it's um, the the I mean the the, the Cambridge uh, alumni network uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is, uh, is just uh, plays such an, an important role in 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 the life of uh, you know Cambridge graduates who are who are moving around the world because it's a a ready-made network that, that, that's available mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. and um i mean on on my, uh, on my hiking trip in the lake district at the moment there there are actually three other cambridge graduates uh yeah. in, including one other who is a who is a uh, a uh, a um trust a trust scholar alum so uh, but really wow. certainly, uh, the, the cambridge alumni network and and the trust alumni network mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. does play a a, a real role in in, uh, mm -hmm. in in your life, moving around the world, and and indeed even uh, resulted in me meeting people back home mm -hmm. in Australia that I wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. have met. So uh, this this network uh, that is established by by spending time at uh, at Cambridge is is just incredibly valuable uh, socially uh, and professionally, uh, and I, I can only encourage the. Uh, the uh, the forthcoming uh, matriculating class who are who are on the call with us to mm. absolutely take advantage of that. You know, if if you're from a country that is well represented in Cambridge, as Australia is, strive not to be just one of the clump of Australians. You know, make friends from uh, other jurisdictions, uh, other other continents, um, because uh, you know you. you you, you, you can you can meet people from your own country every day for the rest of your life if you want to once you go home from Cambridge but this is a unique opportunity uh, to develop your network in a way that is not ordinarily available to you and I commend that opportunity to each and every one of you. Thank you very much Andrew I think that's really valuable advice and um, can I ask Yomna now to, to, to say some more. Yomna you very um, uh, generously already contributed quite a lot of your time making making uh, making um, um, uh, films for us. So you came uh, to Cambridge um, on a Rowan Williams studentship, one of the, the first uh, students on that uh, special studentship. And uh, you're originally from Libya. And like Andrew, you studied law. So tell us how it has been uh, making that transition from um, from Cambridge to where you are now. Uh, well, hello everyone, I'm Yamna, um, and I'm very, very proud to be here, especially as the first cohort of Rowan Williams Scholars. It's lovely seeing the video with the new cohort, so I'm glad, you know, they're also having a positive experience, even though, you know, it's a bit different this time. Um, so I, yeah, I grew up in Libya and because of the war there, I moved to Cyprus. And then I was studying with Cypriots and, and other international students because Cyprus is such an international hub. And I was probably mm -hmm. the only Libyan at my university. So I, I constantly had, I guess, you know, that identity conflict. Who am I? Where do I fit in? I'm, I'm an international student, but at the same time, I now live here for so long in Cyprus, but at the same time, home is in another place. And I, I, I took these things along with me to Cambridge, to my journey um, to Cambridge. And I was greeted with a lot more people, a lot more international students, a lot more, um, a lot more experiences. And I think my time at Cambridge really helped me kind of like consolidate everything and realize that it's okay to have very, very different, you know, um, aspects in your life that don't necessarily come together and like you've been a bit been everywhere and done a bit of everything and kind of you know you're a bit of an odd puzzle piece but 
because a lot of people are like that at Cambridge, I felt like we were all, you know, messily, um, you know, we fit in a really messy way, I guess. We kind of, you know, fit there. Everyone was very unique, but we did fit. And um, I slowly felt like what made me different actually made me quite special. And I was able to bring so much more to my community at college, at the law faculty, um, and also at my current workplace. So like Andrew, I also landed a role at um, an incredible firm, uh, Clifford Chance, which is a magic circle firm like Andrew's, but clearly we are better. Um, so I will see you in you know, the deals rooms and stuff. Um, but yeah, um, it wasn't easy, of course. I mean, just because, just because you know, you're, you're top of your class and this, that, and the other doesn't mean that the journey is um, easy. Mm -hmm. But what Cambridge did was actually equip me with what I needed to, you know, have that confidence to go into that interview room and, and show them who I was and really make the most of what made me different. Um, and so all of that international stuff from my background translated perfectly into why I wanted that job. It was an international firm with a lot of different people, a lot of clients. And my weaknesses essentially became my strengths. And I didn't realize that until I went to a place as diverse as Cambridge and met a lot of people that actually said, hey, you know, you think of this as your weakness, but actually this is what's going to make you stand out. And I found the communities and the tools and, you know, there were guest lectures and incredible people constantly visiting that I could speak to and, and share my story. Even, you know, Rowan Williams is, himself was amazing. Um, and I, I really feel like my time at Cambridge refined my pre-existing skills, but also gave me a whole new outlook of life and kind of like this excitement to just pursue different things because I'm so out of my comfort zone. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm currently back home in Cyprus, my, my home for, for a while now, uh, visiting family, enjoying the sunshine. Um, not going to rub it into everyone's faces in the UK, but it's 32 degrees here. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll be starting my legal practice course in July, which is essentially kind of like how we qualify. So I, I do an intense six month course and then I start with the firm in February, hopefully in person, because I have a lot of clothes that I would like to wear. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an amazing experience and um, I'm really well, proud of it. Congratulations, Yomna. And congratulations on, 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 on your, um, your, your uh, job to come. And uh, you know, I, you. The, 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 the road wasn't easy, as, as I know, that the LLM is very oh, tough course. Not. And what, yes. what a, you know, you were, you were, I, I remember when you were here, you, had, you, were, you were so energetic and into so many different <laughs> activities. And, um, you know, um, that doesn't come easily to, to, to everyone. Um, and also the students this year have not even had the chance to, to uh, meet people in a normal way. Where did you yeah. find that confidence and that energy to, to get involved in activities outside your academic work? To be honest, I think it's because I knew that I was doing a one year degree but at the same time, because of everything that I heard about Cambridge and, and all the opportunities that were here, um, I really wanted to you know, go out there and see and, and, and explore and, and figure out if there was anything new that I liked. You know, I think, I think this, this time of our lives is, is really good for just exploring and trying to really understand what you do like, what you don't like, what interests mm -hmm. you, what intellectually stimulates you. Um, and yeah, I definitely did a lot. Uh, I learned how to row. I was um, doing a lot of law related things, uh, trust related things, um, getting, you know, getting to know a lot of people in different activities. And I think mm -hmm. I said in, in our last trust event mm -hmm. that I realized down the line that I should have been a, a bit a bit more um, picky with my activities because it's very easy to take on so much because you're just so excited, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that is quite difficult to balance alongside your degree. Mm -hmm. And I, I gave a piece of advice where I said, I had like this rule of three that I now just tell everyone who reaches out to me on LinkedIn or, or um, other social media asking for advice. I, I think, you know, narrowing it down to three, um, one athletic activity, 
one social and one academic related. Mm -hmm. And that way you get to experience, you know, very different things, but at the same time also remain centered. Um, so if I could go back to, to Yomna pre-COVID, I would say, calm down, slow down. <laughs> um, it's okay to stay indoors for like a day. You don't have to go out all the time. Um, but yeah, um, I think, I think I'm glad I did because now we're constantly <laughs> indoors, but I was, I was trying to do way too much. And the rule of three is something that a lot of students have told me is a good, you know, guiding, yes. uh, yes. guiding yes. light. So, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. That's, that's very valuable advice. And, and so, well, I, I just really like to thank the three of you for, for, um, keeping in touch and for, for generously being available to help uh, this generation of Cambridge Trust Scholars and, and future generations of Cambridge Trust Scholars. Um, you, you, you're, you, I'm just very, very proud to have you as uh, alumni of the programme. And I think that uh, today's students have really valued being able to connect with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.